Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, I wanna take a look at how insulin is released from the pancreas. Now remember that insulin is the key that unlocks the doors of the cells to let glucose in from the bloodstream into those cells so the cells can store it or use it for energy. So insulin is extremely important. Now I want you to have a think of a couple of things, right? First thing is, we know that insulin is produced by the pancreas. So we've got this strange structure that sort of sits behind the stomach called the pancreas and there's a number of little areas on the pancreas which are filled with cells and they're called pancreatic islet cells. Now, they used to be called islet of Langerhans, but we stopped naming things after old dead guys a long time ago. These islets contain different cell types. They've got beta cell types, which produce the insulin, and they've got the alpha cell types that produce another hormone called glucagon. Now think of the gon in glucagon. This gets released when glucose is gone, right? There's not enough glucose in the bloodstream. Let's release this to increase blood glucose. Insulin drops blood glucose, glucagon increases it, and the pancreas, specifically these islets, are the area that's most responsible for these hormones to be produced. Now these hormones are released into the bloodstream to have their effects on a wide array of tissues of the body. I wanna look at how insulin specifically is released from the pancreas. Now I said they came from beta cells, so I wanna draw up a beta cell here. And first thing I wanna talk about is the fact that the major stimulus for insulin to be released is glucose. So if I draw glucose up like that, glucose once ingested, so let's just say you have a meal. You have a meal, it goes through your digestive tract, gets broken down, the complex carbohydrates turn into basic glucose, which gets absorbed through your gut wall into the bloodstream. Now, what, when it's in the bloodstream, it travels all throughout the body and it goes to all the tissues of the body, including the pancreas, which means the concentration of glucose is high in the blood compared to the concentration of glucose in tissues. So that means you've got a high concentration of glucose outside the cell compared to inside. And we know what happens in these scenarios, diffusion. High concentrations always go down to low concentrations. But in order for this glucose to get in to this beta cell, it needs a transport mechanism. And this transport mechanism takes that glucose and throws it inside. And what this is called is a glucose transporter. And there's a couple of different types. This glucose transporter is called GLUT, GLU, standing for glucose, T for transporter, so GLUT2. That's the specific type. It's actually reversible. It can throw it in and throw it out. Now, it takes this glucose in down its concentration gradient. Now, glucose is inside the cell. We all know that glucose undergoes a number of different reactions. It will turn from glucose into glucose 6-phosphate, and you know that now this is starting the glycolysis pathway to produce ATP. That's where we're going here. And in order for this to happen, we need an enzyme called glucokinase. I'm saying this because glucokinase is one of the rate-limiting steps in this process. So glucose 6-phosphate, going through the glycolysis pathway, will ultimately turn into something called pyruvate. Pyruvate jumps into the mitochondria, and we know a couple of things happen. In the mitochondria, the pyruvate undergoes the Krebs cycle. It also jumps into the membrane of the mitochondria, undergoing oxidation, and what it ends up spitting out at the end of the day is a whole bunch of ATP. And ATP is produced from ADP, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates, add an additional phosphate, ATP, triphosphate, this is the energy currency of the body, we'd need this. Now what has this got to do with insulin release? All right, we're getting there. A couple of things, let's draw up two channels of great importance. There's a channel here, and a channel here. This channel, what it does, is it's a potassium channel. We know that we have high concentrations of potassium inside our cells compared to outside. And that means potassium wants to go outside. What this channel does is it has a lid on it. And this lid is open when there's no glucose inside the cell. So think about it like this. Let's say that there's no glucose. So this process doesn't happen. If this process doesn't happen, ATP isn't produced. And so we have high amounts of ADP because it hasn't yet been turned into ATP. So high ADP and low ATP. And what this means is the ADP sits on the lid of that channel, keeping it open. That's ADP. 
Now, if it keeps it open, it means potassium can leak out of the cell. And if potassium leaks out of the cell, it takes its positive charge with it. So all this positive stuff leaves the cell, and that means the inside of the cell becomes a little negative compared to outside. So the inside becomes negative compared to the outside because all that positive potassium is leaving the cell. Now, if you were to compare the charge difference from inside to outside, you'll find it's going to be around about negative, sorry, negative 70 millivolts. Let's just quickly draw this up in a chart, right, on a graph. Let's say we've got negative 70 here, we've got negative 50 here, we've got zero here, and let's say we've got positive 30 here. Right now, we're at negative 70. Okay, so this is what's happening. When we have glucose, glucose turns into pyruvate, jumps into the mitochondria, produces ATP from ADP. So when glucose is in the beta cell, ADP levels go down, ATP levels go up, that ADP jumps off the lid, the lid closes now, which means potassium doesn't leak out the cell and the potassium remains inside the cell and the increased amount of ATP, ATP actually sits on this lid and keeps it shut. This is called an ATP sensitive potassium channel. ATP sensitive potassium channel. Now, if this potassium stays inside, it's no longer negative, it's starting to be a little bit more positive, which means this negative 70 drifts up into it being a little bit more positive. If it becomes so positive that it hits negative 50, well, this is when this other channel kicks into play. This channel is sensitive to charge. So what will happen is once we hit negative 50 millivolts, which is now what's happened, we've now gone to negative 50 millivolts, this channel opens its lid and it's a calcium channel. And we know calcium sits outside the cell. All right, that means calcium wants to come in. And when calcium enters a cell like this, calcium, as we know when we did the nervous system, likes to push vesicles that contain substances out. Inside the beta cell, we've got these little vesicles that hold insulin. Calcium says, all right, time to go. And this vesicle merges with this membrane and pushes the insulin out. Insulin releases mediated by calcium influxing into the beta cell. All right, let's just quickly reiterate. Glucose needs to get into a beta cell. Glucose needs to turn to pyruvate via glucokinase. Pyruvate needs to get into the mitochondria, undergo the Krebs cycle and oxidation to produce ATP. ATP shuts the ATP-sensitive potassium channel, and potassium increases inside, making it more positive. This positive change is called depolarization. This event is called depolarization. The cell needs to depolarize in order for calcium channels to open, for calcium to enter, and calcium pushes insulin out. Reason why I'm telling you all this is because if you want to regulate insulin from being released or not being released, you either need to play around with whether there's gonna be glucose in the cell, whether glucokinase is working properly, whether you have enough ATP, whether calcium is coming in, or whether you're depolarizing the cell. You can actually do any of these particular things really, and it's gonna promote or inhibit insulin from being released. So for example, there is a genetic disease which is glucokinase mutation. This gene has a mutation, so this enzyme is dysfunctional, which means glucose doesn't turn to glucose 6-phosphate. None of this happens. Insulin isn't released. If insulin isn't released, the glucose remains high in the blood. If this happens over time, that's diabetes. So a mutation in glucokinase can form or cause a relatively rare form of diabetes called MODI. MODI is maturity onset diabetes in the young due to a mutation in glucokinase. But what if you want to promote insulin being released. That's stopping it, right? And that's by nobody's fault but a mutation. There are certain drugs for diabetics because in diabetes, you want to release the insulin at specific times, right? So there's drugs called oral hypoglycemic drugs. It drops blood glucose levels. That's the plan. If glucose stays high in the blood, it damages blood vessels, damages tissues. It's bad news. You don't want high glucose in the blood for a long time. So what can we do to promote that release? Well, this is what these oral hypoglycemics do. They block this potassium channel. 
pretty much the same way ATP does. These drugs are called sulfonylureas, okay? And these sulfonylureas sit on that channel lid, stopping potassium. Potassium stays inside, depolarizing the membrane, opening the calcium channel, calcium forces insulin out. So these sulfonylureas, that's their mechanism of action. Now, there's things in the body that also do this. So, for example, it's not just glucose. Glucose isn't the only nutrient that does this. Amino acids do this. Fatty acids do this. Ketones do this. These are all nutrients. All of these nutrients can jump in and promote insulin release. But, how's this? They may be able to do it by themselves, but if they've got glucose with them, it's potentiated, it's supported, it's enhanced, it's a synergistic relationship. There's more than the sum of their parts. So if amino acids are in the beta cell with glucose, way more insulin is released than just amino acids and just glucose by themselves. All right? The thing is, the way they work is they basically, when they come in, amino acids and fatty acids pretty much jump in at this phase. Right? So that means, and ketones basically jump in too around about this phase because ketones are pretty much just a bunch of acetyl-CoA's snapped together. And acetyl-CoA's is a substrate in the Krebs cycle. So they all jump in, which means the way that they, the way that amino acids, fatty acids and ketones promote insulin release is simply by producing ATP. But in addition to that, there's certain amino acids like arginine, and arginine is a positively charged amino acid. There's other positively charged amino acids, the cationic, and if they have a positive charge, it means they're gonna depolarize the cell similar to keeping potassium in. And that means that these amino acids probably have a greater effect in pushing insulin out than other amino acids, all right? Okay, so oh, there's actually another way. Amino acids can jump in by piggybacking with sodium, which has a positive charge, and sodium will do the same thing. Positive charge, depolarizing the cell, calcium, insulin out. But there's other things in the body, okay? So think about the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. They play an important role because what they do is, so the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest, right? And the rest and digest system is going to function predominantly through that vagus nerve down this area. The vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve. It releases acetylcholine, and acetylcholine promotes insulin from being released. That makes sense. Resting and digesting, you want insulin to be released. With the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight and flight, it's a little bit more difficult because when we have a look at the sympathetic nervous system, what we're going to get is this, right? Sympathetic nervous system, here's the brain, here's the brain stem, cerebellum. The thoracic and lumbar area is the area in which neurons exit for the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. Now the preganglionic neurons, there's one, that, or one group, that go to the kidneys, the pre. There's usually two neurons, this is the first one. And it goes to the kidney and goes to the adrenal gland on the kidney and it stimulates the adrenal gland to release two things of importance, cortisol and adrenaline. Now, they're both hormones. What cortisol does is it increases blood glucose levels because it tells stored glucose in the form of glycogen to be released. Blood glucose levels go up. If blood glucose levels go up, glucose comes in, insulin's released. Adrenaline, what adrenaline can do is Similarly, increase blood glucose levels, but adrenaline can directly bind to beta-2 receptors on this process and promote insulin release as well. You don't want this happening over time. You don't want increased cortisol levels over time because it can result in diabetes because increased blood glucose levels over time are going to exhaust this cell. Anytime you exhaust a beta cell, overly pushing out all this insulin, it gets tired and stops. That's type 2 diabetes. So you've got these systems working as well. There's other systems, right? So there's what's called the incretins, and there are a whole bunch of digestive hormones that get released, and they pretty much all push out insulin, right? GIP, GLP-1, for example, um, uh, cholecystokinin, they all promote insulin from being released. One strong negative um, mediator here is somatostatin. Somatostatin likes to stop everything basically in the body and somatostatin will stop insulin release. 
So there's a run through of insulin released from the pancreas.